Information Information Services, and it fits in different ways in the university. So we have an MSc uh, program in GIS and Geographical Information Science, and you can see. Will the pointer work? Yes, you can see here the GI services is is one component of this. So this is a second semester module that they do um, things like this: fundamentals of GIS and spatial data handling in the first semester, and those are pretty sort of classical um, GIS. So courses that they use uh, <coughs> GIS, um, for the uh, for the training that they do hands on with the sort of desktop systems and um, some programming and, and this and that um, and so in some ways the GI services course which is second semester is a counter to that as a foil if you like for it that um, having done all of the the sort of proprietary software in the first term or first semester in the second semester in the GI services. Partly it's about web and internet GIS and, and getting away from just sort of desktop stuff, but also it's about exposure to and use of uh, the open source sort of suite and uh, OSGO software. So that's kind of how GI services fits inside the MSc program. But also, it fits inside um, another program at the university, our Horizon Doctoral Training Centre. So, um, one or two people here who've been presenting here are part of the, the DTC. So, for example, Mark Eiliff and Laura Kinley, who've presented here or been involved here, are uh, DTC students. So, this is a four-year uh, PhD program. And broadly, the students on this are studying PhDs in the area of pervasive and ubiquitous technology. So this clearly has sort of strong sort of location elements. And it's quite focused on sort of new media, web and mobile stuff. The intake is about 15 to 18 students a year on this program. And it's multidisciplinary. So the students come in. Some of them have strong computer science backgrounds. Others have been doing design or business studies. Very broad range of students. Um, and as part of the four-year program, they do 120 credits um, of training, which is roughly equivalent to this to sort of doing the taught part of a master's degree. And GI services is a, is a core module, but is an optional core module. So not all of the, it's a weird way to put it, but um, so not all of the 15 students here a year will take GI services, but they sort of uh, uh, complement the, uh, the MSc students. So as a, as a result, in the GI services module itself, it's a very sort of mixed student group. You know, they've got so qualified, whatever qualified means here, I'm not sure what I meant there. Qualified computer scientists are students almost new to computing. Students who've done a, a semester of GIS training and have had all the stuff about uh, points, lines and polygons, vectors, rasters, you know, object models, field models, and then students who are coming to GIS almost for the first, first time. So it's an it's a interesting balance of, uh, of training, this, uh, this module. So... What's the pattern of classes? How is this, this taught? It's an alternating pattern. One week they uh, have a le lecture, and the following week they have uh, practical classes through the, uh, through the semester. And this is sort of broadly how these things <coughs> pair. One of the arrows has slipped already. So there's an introduction, and that sort of pairs with a, just an introductory session to OSGO Live, getting, getting around the Zubuntu uh, system, and opening QGIS, because they've done some desks, most you know, sort of some of them have done the desktop GIS before. A bit of introduction to desktop GIS with, with QGIS. Second week, we come on to uh, spatial databases. Oh, so Sorry, second pair of weeks. And that's paired with a practical and loading um, post-GIS. Open geospatial web services goes with practical work in GeoServer to s set up um, layers and, and ex exploring service interfaces to those layers, so actually doing some manual AT HTTP requests and, and looking at XML responses, and that's on top of the post-GIS layers they've set up, plus some shapefile layers. Yes, I use shapefiles. And then there's the uh, tiled mapping, and we talk about um, GeoServer SLDs, and in the practical also connecting open layers then to the services they've created in GeoServer. It's a week for them to catch up, and then a separate piece of work. So at the end of this, they have a piece of coursework to, to hand in that is a build-up of all of the work that they've done. And actually, in the piece of coursework, they sort of marry two different pieces of the um, practical work together. So up to here, they've set up services, 
and then they have a slightly separate piece of work which is, introduces them to open layers. And the final sort of bringing it all together is actually to connect open layers to the services they've, they've created and to create an, an actually an appropriate web map um, interface to, to some data analysis they've done in through this uh, practical in QGIS as well. So it, kind of the coursework, they've kept up with the individual practical elements, the coursework kind of brings this all together. So at the end, they also do some API programming, we, uh, which is separate from the, the coursework. And we, you know, we, one of the aims of uh, the MSc program, at least, is that they should see commercial and uh, open solutions, because that's, they're going out to the world of work. Still, that's what they need. So we do rather that, so they've done some work in open layers as an API, and we kind of compare and contrast that with uh, using Google Maps. So that's kind of the structure of this, that this uh, OSGO Live thing uh, sort of fits into. So it's a, a pretty sort of brisk um, pace through this to, uh, to keep going through all of this. So the first sort of iteration of this was in the um, spring of 2012 last year. It feels like, uh, feels like several years ago already. And indeed, this was quite a... Yeah, previous version of OSGO Live. This is 5.0 that uh, we used in this. And my first sort of attempt or solution at this was to use um, Oracle VirtualBox for the uh, for the system. And I came up with a uh, cunning plan for this. So we were in. I don't know if any of you've been in the B26E lab here, but that's if you've been to one of the workshops in in this building. It's in that in that room. So that's a networked Windows 7 lab, and associated with that, we have a sort of SAN storage um, as well. So I wanted to be able to use that. One of the aims here was that the students didn't have to be in any particular lab, that they could move or even take something home to, to work with, so that they, they had sort of portability of what they were doing. So um, the VM is too big just to put on the SAN and let them access over the network, and lots of network contention that way. So the, the, uh, the original VM image, the sort of source OSGO Live image, went on the local C drives of every one of the, the PCs and set up as one of these multi-attached virtual disks, which means that VirtualBox doesn't touch that image. It saves everything in, the, in diff files, and those diff files went up to the, the SAN. Okay? And so there was some testing of that, and in... Uh, for me, doing it with a, or with a couple of PCs, that was working fine. Um, but it means that you could take your snapshots away, and, uh, and those, would, those are relatively small, so they're easy at the end of a class to save, and you could go away and, uh, and work on this stuff at home, for example. Okay. However, once you've got a class of 20-odd sort of students, and you're relying on the network linked to the SAN, however good it is, this started to get a bit sort of temperamental. Okay, actually, they're saving the diffs and the access. And worse still, a problem that became more obvious as the, as, as from sort of class to class is that they, although you're using the same exact same file on each of the PCs, if you're not careful when you set up the, the VM, it gets a UUID, a unique ID, which means that you're kind of locked to working on the VM on that on that machine. Now there are ways around that, but in the middle of a class and with this sort of uh, some of the issues with using the network links and, and the uh, disk being temperamental, this was starting to get sort of flaky after about sort of three weeks of, uh, or sort of three of these uh, sort of practical sessions. So that was turning into a, a not good solution quite quickly. So actually halfway through this um, course, we sort of made an emergency right turn and switched to using the USB Live system. So it was a non-ideal, shall we say. So we were, uh, So the first question is how, how to just buy 20 USBs. doesn't sound like very much, but in a university, there's always a question of who's going to pay. And we're lucky that the Ordnance Survey set, stepped in and uh, sponsored the, uh, the USBs. And uh, so they got some branding on the, uh, on the USB drives. And this was quite a positive experience. Um, there's a slight downside. We bought 8 gig USB drives, about sort of nine pounds uh, each. So that's not, yeah, not too huge a cost. The problem is that the persistence file on a USB system is limited to four gig, for for the usual sorts of reasons. Not least that this is a FAT32 system on the USB drive, and and all sorts of addressing issues. 
And so the virtual file system is limited in size, and you don't get to use the whole 8 gig of the, of, of the disk drive itself. You've got sort of 4 gig plus the um, original sort of image of the Zubuntu system. And of course, the practicals had done had been tested with the virtual box system, so we actually crashed into some problems with the students saving the zip files and the unzipped files and everything else all in this persistence file and it filling up. So there were some smaller issues with them just filling the disk space and the Zubuntu system grinding to a halt because it had no uh, no scratch space. But it worked, so it was a bit sort of uh, bit difficult in places. But 17 of the 20 students submitted successful coursework that year. One, one of the three dropped out for non-technical reasons. Um, so two of them uh, had to resubmit the coursework, which actually isn't a bad ratio on, on coursework anyway, I, th I think. But it, it's still, because of all the switching around, it was a less than ideal sort of learning experience for them because they learned as much as anything about trials and tribulations of using live systems as much as the, uh, the sort of GIS components itself. But good things, you know, the OSGO Live environment is a sandbox server in a box. You know, that the idea of setting up servers for all of them to work on that might be web accessible and so on was just a bit problematic in the, in the university. It's easier that they s stick something up. You, you can use the physical host to connect to the live system possibly so you can do a bit of uh, so testing that way, but it's, it's much less exposed. It doesn't matter so much what they screw up. They each have their own system to work with. So generally, I was happy with the general sort of possibility of the live system here. Um, there's quite a bit of time wasted and student confusion raised by the VM configuration at the start, all this stuff about where you're saving diffs and what diffs are, and then the, the sort of problems later on. But also, there's a, so a hell of a lot of technology here in this stack to have to get through. So within the course, for, to, on the so golden thread of just getting them through that stack of things from working out how to, Zubun, to do Zubuntu all the way through to having an open layer system, you know, there's all of this sort of stuff that they're having to get some sort of uh, grip on in here. And so there's quite a big learning curve just to, just to get through to how, to how do you produce a web map, okay? and understand some of the component technologies. You know, we, you could probably go to Mapbox or something and just drop some data in and make a map. But the aim here is to actually understand something of the stack of, of software to, to make it as well. So this year then, this last uh, spring, um, we went for uh, just straight to the so USB drive solution. The deal with the, for the students with the USB drives was that they could, they gave me a £10 deposit for the drive. They could either keep the drive at the end or they could swap it back for the £10. In the previous year, most of them uh, kept the USB drive, so I had money and could, you know, a stack of cash basically, and I could buy new USB drives mostly. Those were one or two uh, who'd return them. So it was exactly the same model, a Kensington Data Traveller um, stick. In the previous year, in 2012, every stick was exactly the same capacity. Um, and so you could write onto it an image for the whole, just, you know, disk image essentially, for the USB uh, stick, including any partitions and things. In this set, each, each USB drive just varied a tiny bit in, in capacity for, uh, for some reason. And so that meant a, a switch around that you had to create partitions and then write partition images which is a bit more complex and meant having to work out, work a different uh, way to create the sticks and it's just slightly slower. But this piece of software, Clonezilla, I found very useful for actually, you know, once you've got your master USB of taking images of the partitions on it and then being able to write it back onto, uh, onto sort of duplicate uh, USB drives. I had a new partitioning scheme because I didn't like the idea of this wasted space at the, uh, at the end of the, uh, the drive. So it looks like this, so you have to have a, the yellow ring there is you have to leave a little bit of a gap in between the two partitions. So one is blocked at the front of the drive, the other is blocked at the end of the drive, and there's a gap in the middle that accommodates this variation in, uh, in actual physical space on the drive. And so you take a, basically a partition image for the so master partition and the um, FAT32 partition, you set, and there's a parted um, script that sets up the basic structure and then Clonezilla writes into it.
Okay, so that sets up a USB drive and a way to, uh, to clone it. And so this, this was a lot more successful, that they're just not having any of the stuff about VM configuration. They basically got a drive and they could use it. Save, you know, saved a lot of, if you like, mental capacity and work time within the, within the course. So it made the course more relaxed. Um, however, these USB drives this, this year seem to, like I said, they're a bit different from last year's one, and they failed much more. So four of them just died completely. It seemed to be actually the physical interface, putting them into the machine, no recognition of, of anything um, plugged in. Two or three of them, the students managed to screw up the file system somehow and needed partition, uh, partitions being recovered. The advantage of having the two partition scheme is that essentially where the aim was that they kept this partition as mostly system and they put data up here. And that actually worked quite, quite well because it tended to be the system partition that got corrupted. Because of having separate partition images, it's possible to sort of splat back a new version of the system in the lower partition, and they've still got their data preserved in the, in the top partition as well. So it's also, if they stick to how they should be putting the data on, it's also a bit more, yeah, yeah, a bit safer. And they can always back up that partition as well to hard drives at home and things to help preserve their work. Because one, the, the one of the reasons I went for VM in the first place is students lose USB drives. You don't want them just losing all of their work a week before submission and things. And this gave a bit of protection for this. Because this partition at the top is FAT32, it's easily read, although Windows 7 doesn't mount it for all sorts of reasons. Just, uh, just Windows uh, issues in 7. This one is a squash FS and is much more difficult to access from a separate system. Um, so another reason for getting them to put data up here is it's a simpler partition to access as well. So where have we got to? Yeah, so actually in the end, despite one or two sort of teething problems or I issues with the USB drives, all the students submitted this year. One a day or some day or two late, and so they all passed except the guy who submitted late because the, and that was just because of the late penalty. So it's more successful in terms of uh, student outcome this year, and, uh, partly because it's the second time round, and I had some bugs in just what the practical work was, but also just there was it was much simpler. So this will be be repeating this course again this year. So what am I going to do this year? I'd been thinking of just using the live USB again and probably using live 7. It's a shame there's not got QGIS 2 on, but uh, there we are. 7.5 isn't out quite in time for this, this course. The 0.5 releases come just after I've started the course, which is uh, slightly disappointing, but just one of those things. But maybe I'll look at uh, a different live system. I know some of the presenters here have built their own Ubuntu live systems, which are a bit more sort of slimmed down. That's a possibility. But I came in working on some of the work with people on some of the workshops here. I came across Portable Virtual Box, which packages Virtual Box into an executable you can run off a live disk. Live six is very slow to boot, okay, and it was much slower than Live five to boot. The biggest disadvantage this year was having to wait for Live six to boot, um, and actually loading it into memory as a off a VM image does does have some advantages. So I might go for this uh, this scheme. Or other things I might experiment with is setting up Amazon instances for, for each of the students and get away from having physical devices at all that they can access those instances anywhere. But that needs, uh, needs some different form of payment and that might get in the way. And then possibly over with some discussions around here, maybe some sort of thing, client thing, but I think that's too difficult with our uh, firewalls and proxies. So I suspect it'll... The so part of minimum action is to use Live 7 and just go for the same thing again, maybe a different make of USB drive this year, but um, it, it was reasonably settled uh, by the end of last, uh, this uh, last session. So I think that's the, that's the run through. Have I done for time? Not too bad. So if you want, uh, want any more, if you want a bit more detail of, set it, of the sort of trials and tribulations of setting up the USB drives and things, if you go to my, I don't often blog, but I did write it, it up on my uh, blog page here if you want uh, more about this or just uh, contact me uh, directly. So, thank you.